Hey guys, welcome back and I hope you will enjoy and benefit from my analysis of yet another video by the Muslim apologist who on Speaker's Corner and on YouTube calls himself Muhammad Hijab. His video runs just over 11 minutes and is quite irritating with multiple cuts and missing audio. But it's the contents that is worthy of a comment. So when listening to the performance of this M. Hijab, my reactions sort of vary between roaring laughter and multiple face palms. Now what is actually quite sad is that most of the utter nonsense being distributed here is stuff he was schooled on. He has the information. He knows that what he is saying is false. And what I realize is this this entire spiel that he has with atheists and belief, this is just a smokescreen. All he does is bring up two ancient old claims, the fine-tuning of the universe for life, whatever that may mean, and the cosmological argument, where both, come on, they've been debunked, refuted, and ridiculed to death. So why bring them up again? Anyway, so this is the level of intellectual honesty we encounter with this guy again and again. And that's what I'm trying to show here so that people can see what reality actually is for this guy. Another thing I observed is that, you know, he throws around the names of philosophers a lot, but then produces a total cock up when quoting them. So to me, it seems he does not really understand what he's talking about. And instead, he simply fabricates stuff using random words he thinks sound impressive. I remember Hamza Tsvotas used to do this, and he was caught out, so I don't know why people don't learn. Okay, now, at the start, while his brother-in-arms, Ali the Dawa, collects some questions they can't answer from the audience, I want every single one of you guys to write one question down. The hijab guy does his entertainment act, the atheist I don't understand, routine. He starts off by saying he will address objections atheists may have. Now, they didn't quite clear up the audio, so the quality is quite bad. Uh, some objections that atheists may have. He says he will go through some objections atheists may have. So I'm repeating this just in case you didn't hear this because the audio is cutting out at times. And please note that, you know, every time I listen to this, I feel like screaming, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's that bad. But I'll try and calmly provide some highlights and we'll go through them one by one. Now, hijab starts off by talking about atheists. Personally, I oppose calling myself atheist due to all the old-fashioned and negative baggage associated with this word. And I think identifying as something I'm not is quite ridiculous, like being an a-racist or a-dragonist. I think it's quite stupid. And I also don't lack anything. There's nothing I need, least of all from a deluded theist, that would make me more complete or better. So that I, I don't lack anything. I find this quite absurd. Just for the sake of, of, of moving the discussion forward, I would agree to label myself as atheist. Then this being a non-believer, non-theist, or someone where this God believer is absent, then this is purely based on the lack of gods or goddesses, the lack of any compelling evidence for the existence of any of these supernatural beings. And then he says, uh, some objections that atheists may have. No, the only way the word objection can be used here is when referring to my not accepting stupid, illogical, or dishonest claims made by apologists. It doesn't matter what color, what stripe, whatever. It's the apologist claim that I object to. So in summary, there's only a single objection, and that is regarding the claimed evidence of and for gods, which does not exist. That's why apologists have to fabricate stuff and declare it as evidence for the existence of gods and goddesses, or just for their favorite god. I'm going to try and put myself in the shoes of the atheists for a while, yeah? Really? <laughs> They've run out of atheists in the UK, and now he needs to pretend he could fill the shoes of a person without a god belief? Really? Isn't that biting off more than he can chew? I mean, this guy clearly suffers from what, overconfidence and delusions of grandeur. But hang on, why don't they invite one? Why, why don't they sit down with, for example, me and talk about their beliefs or my absence of a God belief? Is that too difficult? You know, instead of this painful and embarrassing display of incompetence, dishonesty and plain deception. You know, just... Go to an atheist. Don't pretend you're an atheist if you can't. Just get one on there. There's plenty of atheists walking around. Just grab one, ask him, and that's it. 
<laughs> but then, based on my previous observations, why would I expect something like integrity and honesty from this guy? Yeah, anyway, he continues with this absurd line of reasoning, asking... The first thing that's ought to be asked is, when you're asking or speaking to an atheist, say you're an atheist, the question is, what is your true standard? Now, Hijab is clearly confused here. And there's, there's multiple cuts and background noise and making a difficult time. So he says, when you are asking or speaking to an atheist. When you're asking or speaking to an atheist. I remember he said earlier, he is in the shoes of an atheist. Has he abandoned this so quickly? He just forgot to mention it. And he says, say you're an atheist. So is, is he still in the shoes of an atheist or not? Or has he passed this task on to someone else? Or has he simply given up? I don't know. So and he asks, what is your truth standard? What a silly question. Now, either something is true or it's not true, okay? Now, either truth is important for you or it is not. Now, we all know that for hijab it's not. I mean, he's shown this. But this is not a standard. Now, rules and standards are tools to evaluate the likelihood of something being true. But that's it. If something positively compares with reality or can be demonstrated or can be shown to be logically consistent, then I consider this as being true. It's quite easy, actually. The atheist is an atheist because he is not satisfied, for the most part, with the evidences of theism. Right? He really should have invited a real person like me instead of faking this. Now, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know it's going to be difficult, but I will not try to make fun of the 20 or 30 times when evidence is simply not enough and evidences must be better than evidence alone. I've said this a thousand times, but I'll say this again. There is no compelling evidence, nor is there any, no, nor are there any evidences for the existence of gods or goddesses. And that's it. If there were, there would be no people without a God belief or atheists or agnostics or whatever description you want to come up with. If there were, we would abandon the word faith in connection with all these gods. Why is he mentally incapable of grasping this? Now, his approach is inconclusive and useless. It's simply insufficient to ask me to explain the origins of the universe or life or consciousness. And if I am unable to do so, then he declares his God exists based only on my inability to truthfully answer without saying, I don't know. Okay, now it gets quite and bizarre. Atheists. And for the most part, most atheists are negative atheists. And this is where I oscillate between laughter and just face palming. Now, either gods exist or they don't. Okay, so you either believe gods exist or you do not. And what this fool comes up with is the following. The negative atheist just lacks something to make him complete. So they are atheists because of a lack of belief of something. I don't lack anything, China, least of all a childish belief. And the positive atheists, what about those? Not because they have a positive <laughs> argument against, against the existence of God. <laughs> That's how silly this hijab is. He really and genuinely, okay, I know I shouldn't be laughing. I know that I'm supercilious and blah, blah, blah. But it's it really, you cannot take this seriously. You cannot watch this with a, or listen to this with a straight face and not laugh about this. I mean, he really and genuinely does not seem to understand what this is all about. Okay, He simply cannot grasp what a person without this God belief he has is thinking. It's, it's just too much for his damaged brain, damaged by his belief in the Islamic God. How can there be arguments for or against the existence of a fictitious entity? We have two main categories. Um, today we have what we call negative atheist, which makes up the majority, or weak atheist. Uh, who are basically just agnostics. They, they said they lack a belief in God because there's a lack of evidence for his existence or they don't have any sufficient reasons. And then you have strong atheists or what we call positive atheists who state that uh, God does not exist. They have a firm belief that he does not exist. I mean, yeah, and I can prove a negative, you know, just to get this straight because I can provide evidence that there is like no strawberry field outside the ISS. Because I know what the ISS is, and I can demonstrate it. And I know what a strawberry field is, and I can demonstrate it. I can demonstrate both. Now, what I don't know is what a god is, and where outside the universe is. I don't know what either of them are, so I can't discuss them. As a fairy tale, sure, but not as an like, actionable item. 
some, some of them are agnostic. No, come on. Nobody knows. So everyone is agnostic. Just simply forget this word. We are not satisfied completely with the evidences. False. There is no evidence. No evidences either. It's not that I'm not satisfied. It's just that apologists have never, in the last, what, 50,000 odd years where we have evidence of God worship, managed to come up with any good reason to believe what they believe. And if you try and ask them, well, they, they get all aggressive and some even get defensive if you're lucky. But they can't explain anything or reason with people like me and can only preach or threaten. What kind of evidences would you be satisfied with? Okay, this is another ridiculous question. If you don't know what a God is, how can I know what evidence this God is capable of? I can think of hundreds, if not thousands of examples, but none, not one of them, has ever materialized. I mean, just take an example, like in the Quran, in chapter 5, is your Lord able to send down for us a table spread with food from heaven? And then this God says, sure, here you go, bon appetit, they have, enjoy, dig in. Uh, but doesn't forget to threaten you with the heaviest punishment if you still don't develop a God belief. I mean, that's, that's the Quran for you, after all. Now, has anyone in Hyde Park ever seen a table with food materialize? Have Muslims never prayed for food? I'm just, just asking. And just thinking mentally. Exactly. How else would he think other than mentally? If he does, that is. Oh, boy. But... Is maybe this is an example how others do the thinking for him and he just regurgitates what he was fed. Whichever way he now comes up with even more nonsense or what I consider to be nonsense. You tell me, does this make sense? Uh, things which atheists could not deny, right? Number one is incorrigibility, which means something which is not changing. Yeah. So if something is not changing, it becomes a good evidence. Number two is eternality, which is linked to incorrigibility. And number three, you could say, unnecessarily true. Ah, philosophical so, jargon. Yay. Okay, I reject and deny. Now what? How can, how can he say that I cannot, I cannot deny these three things? Okay, let's break this down a bit, okay? Something or someone is incorrigible if correction is impossible. It's the, the correction in the word. In philosophy, however, we have what I actually call a misnomer, what is, what is regarded as something true simply by believing it. Can I fly? No, no matter how much I believe this. And then they always use the same example, which is presented, um, which I actually think this is circular in my eyes in this context, because the cogito in cogito ergo sum actually necessitates existence. So I, I don't think you can use this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, the eternal, I mean, that's, that's nonsensical, as it requires infinity in a conscious being, which can neither be verified nor can it be falsified. So it's useless. And the necessity, oh, come on, this is just wishful thinking, especially since we don't know what the context was in this in which this was used. Uh, okay. Because there was a break, okay, because it says it's necessarily true, but there was a break where we don't know what was said previously to this, so I'm, I don't know what he's talking about. So his evidences are simply based on what childish imagination I'd call this and, and they don't satisfy me or anyone for that matter who has a bit of a brain. And then he comes up with this example which I find quite odd. Well, it's contingently true that I'm wearing a grey jumper, yeah? but it's not necessarily true that I'm wearing a grey jumper. I'm gonna try. Now contingent is relative, okay? it's, it's dependent on something which wearing a jumper is not. Unless you take the existence of the universe or a, an observer and atoms aligned to form a jumper as a contingency. How can this be false? He's wearing clothing. It looks like a jumper. Reflects photons making up a wavelength I would call grey. So where is the logical failure? For me, his claim does not make sense. It's so bad it's not even wrong, I think. And atheists might say that these kinds of things are satisfied in both maths and science. No, total nonsense and completely false. And on top of that, he's contradicting himself when he previously claimed that science always changes. Is this what the Muslims listening to this garbage applaud? How come nobody in the audience objects? How does he get from a person without a God belief to science or mathematics? I wish these people would stop conflating the absence of a belief regarding gods with other things. It's not there. It is wrong. 
You know, it's like asking every vegetarian about the coefficient of lift on a Boeing 747 just because he once met a pilot who happened to be a vegetarian. It doesn't work. Is, is mathematics, as an example here, actually those three things that we've just mentioned? Now, this is something which has plagued the minds of philosophers ever since the time of Plato. Talking about philosophy, throwing around names, but he doesn't know or understand anything, least of all philosophy. Numbers in and of themselves don't exist. You can't touch a number, you can't feel a number, you can't smell a number. Numbers is actually a conceptual abstract reality. Numbers don't exist. Well, okay, because you can't smell, touch them. Can, can you smell, taste or touch an instruction or an idea? No, so ideas don't exist? What about sadness, joy, fear, love, or estimation, intuition, any emotion? Numbers exist, just not in a tangible context. It's a language issue with what a person ex associates with exist. Well, for me, numbers exist because they don't only occur in my imagination and are not just based on my personal opinion. You know, I can ex exchange this. One and one is two. So if I go to another country, to another person, I think most people will agree with me. A statement can be true, not a single number. Well, unless it's 42, of course. Mathematics is an object and can't be assigned the attribute true. Just like my car or Islam can't be considered as being true. If you make a statement like 1 plus 1 equals 2, then it is true. But the number 2 itself is not true, just to clarify this. Plato himself didn't know how to reason with numbers. Basic arithmetic, he didn't Plato, know. Plato, numbers, also, star. Really? Plato himself didn't know how to reason with numbers. He's just making stuff up. This is absurd, dishonest, and misleading. Numbers is actually a conceptual abstract reality. Ah, yes. Muslims in general, in my experience, at least working in the Middle East and Asia, have a huge problem working with abstract models and conceptualizing. Now, if you analyze lots of little steps and then distill the concept from them, you are building an abstract model to work with. But calling reality a conceptual abstract is sheer gibberish. It's meaningless babble. Why is this so difficult for our little apologists to grasp? But in logic, you have to have a truth. In order for a truth to be true, it has to have a physical reality. No, of course not. That's ludicrous. He just explained why. I mean, it's logical, it's mathematical, it's not physical. This is quite embarrassing. And if one idea is better than the other, logically, they can't be equal. Okay, so it's a way of establishing something that is true. If one is better, it can't be the same than the other. So it's logical and this is true. And, you, and all this without being able to either touch or smell it. Imagine that. Objective truth is that which is usually an object. No, this is bull, bull manure at best. He must be, I don't know, drunk or high because he just articulates random words without a coherent structure or any information. Objective truth is an object? <laughs> okay, like I said before, truth cannot be an object and an object can never be truth. I mean, he pretends he understands Plato, G G G G no, Gödel, you mean, and Kant, showing he has no clue what they wrote. Like, Plato, of course, considers mathematical numbers and truth, and but doesn't explain what a truth standard is, though. Oh, boy. Who's a liar? Says, I'm lying. Well, at least now he learned what the liar paradox is. So hopefully I explained it to him in easy enough terms, even though he still doesn't really get it, because he cites it as something like a mathematical problem. Not logis not logics. So, does he really understand this? I doubt it. Or phil a philosophy of maths. This is a big thing. And still unresolved to this day. It's unresolved. Yet people still do maths. Uh, that's because thinking about doing something and doing something are somewhat different. Which means to believe in such axioms, you have to have faith. Because there's no evidence of those axioms. There's no evidence. These things, these axioms or theorems, are based on Assumptions, not concrete evidence. No, wrong again. Come on, I've, I've explained this. Faith is belief which can neither be verified nor falsified. An axiom is exactly the opposite as it defines something. What does any of this have to do with an absence of God belief? I don't understand this. Science is much more flimsy than math. Yes. 
Why doesn't anyone stop this fool? Science is a tool humans use to understand and describe reality. Natural, what happens in nature. They, this is for natural phenomenon. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. And science uses mathematics as a means of describing this reality in a very precise way. There's nothing flimsy here. But not only does science change, the scientific facts change. But the whole framework within which science operates change. <laughs> Where's the true standard definition when you need it? You know, this, this constant idiotic deception this is going on my tits, really. If I, every time I came across, okay, let's just say every time I come across a Muslim, I say the Quran is the Sunnah. And repeat this every single time. No matter how many times I'm corrected and I'm told this is wrong, wouldn't people at some stage just ignore me as an annoying troll and a nuisance? But Hijab does exactly this. He's been told, I don't know how many times, that he is wrong. <laughs> but like a stubborn kid, he will simply not update his brain and just repeat his nonsense. So let me try with the picture, okay? My setup here that I'm using is a straight and level track at sea level and I measure off exactly a thousand meters. I record wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity, density, pressure, visibility. And then I use a light beam to switch on a stopwatch at the start and another light beam to stop the clock after reaching the thousand meter mark. It's a very, very straightforward, simple setup, okay? Now the vehicle runs the track and the stopwatch stops at exactly 30 seconds. Now, using some basic arithmetic, we find the time and the distance and have 30 times 2 times 6. So if the speed remained constant throughout the 1,000 meters, the vehicle was doing exactly 120 kilometers per hour. Simple. I mean, that's it. So now we can hypothesize that speed equals distance over time. And now we test the predictive capabilities of this relationship and find that in this model, if we apply different things, we find that the stopwatch, if it stops at 60 seconds, we halve the rate of speed, carry out several more experiments, varying speeds, opposite directions, and document everything. So varying speeds give us different times. And the next test, all right, the, the relation this of this relationship of speed and time, and then we establish that we can accurately establish the distance. We then publish our findings. The setup is reproduced in different countries, leading to the same result every time. So we, it doesn't matter what numbers we do, what, what kind of um, problem we pose, whether we want to know the distance or the time or the speed, we can always use these three components and always come up with the same identical answers. So we have just used basic mathematics to describe a phenomenon in reality, in the real world, in nature. Will this scientific description ever change? <sighs> Why is this so difficult to grasp? And we can do this for lots of things, just like here on Earth, letting go of a pen will never result in the pen floating out into space. Because here we experience roughly 9.8 meter per second square, and which we call 1G. It is an acceleration towards the center of Earth, which varies, by the way, you know, at the surface on different locations, in different locations, depending on different densities and distances, because there is no such thing as galactic fine tuning. So even here on the planet, it varies. Now, if we work with this, the Newtonian laws, these, these um, relationships that Newton described, we're good here on Earth. But if we now need to something more accurate in measuring objects in space, for example, we need something which not only defines the relationship between mass and energy at rest, but also takes speed into consideration. Enter Einstein, who did not, I repeat, did not replace Newton's findings, but enhanced them. Just like adding a radio to a car will not change the car as such anyway. And just as Newtonian physics breaks down when observing the very large and very fast, both break down when trying to understand the very small. That's where we use quantum physics, which did not, and I repeat, did not replace Einstein or Newton's findings. Newton's basic, the, the, the famous FMA, for example, this law still stands, just as is the case for movement and gravity here on Earth. Nothing changed, and I strongly doubt it will. But there is a minute chance that we humans are all wrong. So we will never say it is 100% something. 
because even just adding a radio to a car does sort of change the weight somewhat. And maybe even the financial values, what is the emotional value such as appeal? So I would never say, it, you know, if I look at the car, adding a, a radio does not change the car at all and not 100% or something, because there's always something that can change and be different. And up until now, this has been the very simple part. And I wish they would just, you know, sort of understand this and stop talking at this point before going on about causes and effects, boundary theorems, infinity or singularities, where they really suck and suck bad. So why go there? But okay, sorry, but this was hopefully worth a detour. So let's get back to our Muslim apologist and his limited perception and processing capabilities. And I, I really wonder whether the listeners in the audience really lap this up and accept everything without thinking, or whether a few realize that he's simply laying down a thick layer of smelly, steaming dung, but they don't say anything. Now, when the atheist is skeptical with the evidences, <coughs> then you have to ask yourself what kind of evidences are you not going to be skeptical of? Exactly what evidences, evidence is he talking about? So far, I've only heard how useless science and mathematics are, even if they work. So what is he talking about? Anyway, we get to a key sentence for him. Because those true standards that I before mentioned at the beginning of this talk, if they're applied to almost any discipline, you would not have faith in anything. You would not believe in anything. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't prove anything. Therefore, the true standard wouldn't work for the atheist. That particular true standard couldn't and wouldn't work. Rather, if we're honest with ourselves, atheistic true standard is a true standard which is probabilistic. <coughs> is a true standard which is probabilistic. We as human beings work on probability reasoning almost every single day. If something is 99% assured, we're happy. If something is 99% assured, we can say we're certain of it almost. Or we can definitely say we're certain of it. Okay, this is... <laughs> this is just a load of hogwash, garbage, useless syllables, just strung together, making no sense. Now, faith is the most inadequate and dishonest way of believing something that I can imagine. We can safely ignore it. I think he's trying to ridicule my approach to accessing reality and truth by claiming that a belief regarding the level of truth towards mathematics and science is unwarranted. And thus, my entire definition of truth is wrong. And this is the literal example of an idiot. Because I am skeptical and careful as to what I accept as fact, and first check before accepting something as truth, or probably true, I am unable to understand the truth, the truth as a whole and its entirety? Really? Is that all he has? This is naive and primitive. The arguments that are put forward by the atheist, or the lack of belief that the atheist has, I would say is unsubstantiated. No, that is now totally false. I don't have to and don't put forward any arguments in my capacity as non-believer, atheist, or whatever you want to call me. I don't need to and I don't have to. Until the theist brings some compelling evidence, there are no gods and no reason to believe otherwise. Doesn't his audience realize that? And equally, no, I do not lack anything, least of all some idiotic belief that you can revive a corpse slapping it with a piece of steak, for example. And he, he must believe this is possible because it is in the Quran. And now, this, this Muslim is actually quite comical, saying my not believing his God is real is a lack of something in my person. And this is unsubstantiated. <laughs> or the lack of belief that the atheist has, I would say, is unsubstantiated. Really? Okay, I know what he's trying to say. But even if he manages to string words together to form a meaningful sentence, it's still wrong. Because the ideas he harbors regarding those who don't hold the God belief is totally wrong. He thinks he's distributed enough doubt and is now getting to the core of the matter, going from atheist to universe, for some unknown reason. But don't worry, it's also something he does not know anything about, also something he does not understand. But this is where he wanted to go all, all along. This is where he feels at home. It's stupid, childish, ridiculous apologetics. Okay, there is no doubt in almost anyone's mind 
that you'll come to very many conclusions about this universe. The fact that it's fine-tuned. Fine-tuning means it's fine-tuned to allow any kind of life to exist within it. This is fine-tuning. Atheists and non-atheists, Muslims, Christians, Jews, anyone who's done science agrees with this. No, nobody in their right mind does. The universe with its galaxies, stars, planets and the crack in the road is not designed and finely tuned for a water puddle. No, this is not normal. This is childish superstition and cognitive dissonance. He talks about science and then falls back on his faulty Quran. Come on, you can't have both. He talks about cosmology where everything is chaotic and then talks about fine-tuning, disregarding the fact that fine-tuning would actually disprove an all-knowing, all-powerful creator God. If the car would have been any different, or it would have looked different, would it still be a car? Yes. So this holds true for a car, where we have a universally accepted definition of a car. Can you please define life and exist? Even Stephen Hawkins, in A Brief History of Time, an atheist, an ardent atheist, he admits to the fine tuning. No, Stephen Hawking says no such thing. He says the opposite. And I've just shown this in my previous video. So this is just another lie. And now comes the usual, the, the Christian. I call it the William Lane Craig line of hilarious snippets of silly reasoning. Who or what designed this universe? And from this perspective, it's quite a straightforward answer. The one or the thing that has designed this universe is that one or that thing that was able to do so. <coughs> and who and what? Who or what could be able to do so? So we employ basic reasoning and we realize that it must have been something or someone with certain characteristics. It must have had knowledge. It must have had power. It must have had the ability to change the situation. It must be one. Had it not been one, there would have been a conflict of interest between the many parties that there would be. This is God. The evidence of God is not just evidence, it's overwhelming probabilistic evidence. We don't have faith in that which is unreasonable. We have faith in that which is clear. See what I mean? It's like a child. Why, why is there a tree? Well, because birds can sit on them. It's obvious, but only to a child, where objects have a purpose, the good old teleological reasoning. Why is there a universe? Well, because my God could build one. For an adult, this is just a logical fail. Why, do you, why would you require faith if everything is so clear? Why only look for signs and not facts if everything is so clear? Why the need to fabricate a supernatural being with its own custom-made outside-of-the-universe reality if everything is so clear? Why would, why would it be, why would he say that two perfect gods would start squabbling over stuff as insignificant as humans? if everything is so clear. How can a human, an, an, an adult human, living in the 21st century, be this childish? How is making outlandish claims equal to evidence? I don't get it. Because listening to this, I just shake my head in disbelief. I actually want to cry when I see how so many minds are wasted. Wasted on ancient superstitions and rituals. And then on top of it, oppressing and killing for a belief. We could only approach this one at a time and show the inconsistencies, the contradictions, the logical failures and the plain errors, while only being able to offer freedom of mind and a passion for the truth in return. That's flippin' difficult and tough, I agree. And what I personally believe is that the atheist has to, they must employ a double standard. Ah, uh, this is the next face bomb. I just want to live and enjoy my life and try to leave this world in a better condition than when I entered it. Theists don't like this. They want me to worship an imaginary God being who does not require worship but demands worship. Why can't they be as tolerant as I am? Why can't the rest, why can't they leave everyone alone? Why try and oppress everyone with this pernicious, misogynistic and brutal ideology? Okay, and as for the video, F for fail. This entire video was just a childish repetition of the cosmological argument and special pleading for the fine-tuning argument. The atheist must dare to think. Yeah. Oh, and if you like, you know, thumbs up. If you don't like, thumbs down. But I'd appreciate if you tell me why. Thank you. Bye.